It's a five. Yeah. 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 Chris Moneymaker eliminates Sam Farhaw, and the 27-year-old has stepped out of the virtual poker room and in a very swift and unlikely manner is atop the poker world. Hey guys, happy Monday. Use discount code Scott's Takes 20 for all Atorius Family Bakery products at shopatoriusfamilybakery.com. Here's my favorite brand, cauliflower and coconut. It is so good. Check me out. Check me out on Facebook story and Instagram for all my amazing recipes. And now I am pleased to welcome our World Series of Poker champion that literally got No Limit Texas Hold'em on the map, Chris Moneymaker. Chris, how are you today? Doing pretty good, Scott. How long did it take you to learn Scott takes 20% or whatever that was? That sounds like a tongue twister. It is a tongue twister. And, you know, I mean, Notorious Family Bakery is our uh, first sponsor. So it's definitely a tongue twister, putting out the promos, remembering them, getting the good of the podcast. But they're a great sponsor. We're going to actually send you some free Notorious Flat oh, sweet. on behalf of Scott's take. So we'll get your information after the podcast. And um, no, you have a million sponsors. So why don't we start off, like, tell me your, like, life story. We obviously know that you entered a $40 satellite online to get a ticket into the World Series of Poker back in 2003. How did it all come in fruition for you in the game of No Limit Texas Hold'em? Yeah, so essentially I was just a, uh, you know, normal guy. I was an accountant, spent seven years in college. Um, worked for Arthur Anderson, which doesn't even exist anymore. Then I worked for Deloitte and Touche. And about the age of 24, I, I got invited to a friend's poker game. And uh, we were playing Dealer's Choice. And we this started happening on a pretty regular basis. We were playing about once a week. And um, we would play all kinds of different games, you know, whether it be Chase the Queen, Midnight Baseball, AC Doocy, mm -hmm. all the games that you would play, you know, sort of with your friends and they're match the pot games there. So, you know, we would start with like $2 and it'd get up to like a three, $400 pot uh, by, you know, if you keep guessing wrong or whatever. Um, well, we had one guy that picked Texas Hold'em every time it was his turn to deal. Right. Um, the problem is, is we didn't know about no limit Texas Hold'em. Back then there was only limit. Mm -hmm. So we only played $1, $2 limit Texas Hold'em. Well, that's the worst game ever. <laughs> it is. It, it's horrible. So whenever it was his turn to deal, we just all folded and said, all right, you win $3 here. Go on, let's pick the next game. So this continued for a while. And then the movie Rounders came out and we figured out you could play no limit Hold'em. Well, that changed everything for us. And all of a sudden, everybody was playing No Limit at Texas Hold'em in our game. Um, I started playing online on Poker Stars, and um, I won a seat, uh, like you said, to the WSOP main event. Mm -hmm. um, I had to win it. It was an $86 tournament. They got me into another tournament that was 615 and that one got me into the main event. So I had to win all both tournaments to get into the main event. Wow. And um, when I got into the main event, obviously, you know, you got to make it four days before you make any money. Mm -hmm. So I'm playing against the best in the world. And I'm some random guy that's been playing around the kitchen table with his friends. <laughs> so obviously I'm coming in as a huge underdog. Mm -hmm. um, but obviously luck was on my side. Um, good, you know, got fortunate in the right spots, picked up the right hands. And I found myself going into the final day as chip leader uh, with a big two million in chips. Um, and once I got to the final table with that many chips, um, I kind of knew how things were going to play out. Mm -hmm. uh, I knew that Sam Parhar and Amir Vahid, two of the most aggressive players at the table, both had about a million. I figured they would butt heads and one of them would bust mm -hmm. and I would go heads up with the other one. And that's, that's what happened. I ended up going heads up against uh, Sam Farhar for all the money and uh, pulled off a massive bluff, which became known as kind of the bluff of the century and also got everybody else in, interested in poker because um, for as much of a 
country hick down home guy I am, Sam Farhar was the epitome of a professional gambler. Like he had you know unlit cigarette hanging out of his mouth. He looked like he stayed, came straight out of casting he into did. you know uh, to play poker, and uh, so he did his part really well uh, unintentionally. Um, but when I was able to pull that big bluff off. And then ultimately won the tournament. It gave everybody hope that they could do it too. And they saw how easy it is. And so everybody started playing poker. And all of a sudden you go from 839 players to 2,500 players the next year up to, you know, 8,000 players a couple of years later. And online poker is taken off. The, you know, every casino um, at the time was shutting down their poker rooms. Um, they started opening them all back up. And yep. Um, so it was just a big resurgent of, of poker. Awesome story. And yeah, you definitely changed the whole uh, dynamic of No Limit Texas Hold'em. I mean, I became a No Limit Texas Hold'em player because of you. And I know producer Mike Fish did too, behind the scenes. What are the keys of being a good Hold'em player? Obviously, tournament and cash is a completely different game. What are the keys of being a good cash player? And what are the keys of being a good tournament player? Well, the, the key to being a, a good poker player whether it be cash or tournament it has to be bankroll management if you don't have that skill then it doesn't matter how good of an actual player you are you're going to go broke mm -hmm. um so first and foremost that's what you need um once you get the bankroll management part and this is where poker becomes really tricky is obviously you need the bankroll management once mm -hmm. you get the bankroll management figured out it really takes um a person that has a sick mind to bluff and to pick spots and to to follow through with that. Um, but other things it takes, it takes a really good memory. You got to remember hands that you played against people 10 years ago. You got to remember, um, you know, hands you played two hours ago with vivid memory and how people reacted. And then it takes, you know, reading situations, reading people, reading motivations. Mm -hmm. You know, why did someone show up? Are they a professional poker player? Are they there for a, you know, a hobby? Is it something that they, you know, are here just to have fun? Right. Or is it something they do to, to feed their family? Mm -hmm. And uh, you have to figure that stuff out and then apply strategies based on both of those. So it, it's a, a complex weave of different skill sets that you need to have. For sure. And, and what do you think? I mean, obviously, like the Doug Polks of the world are all about the solvers, the analytics. That's really taken off the last couple of years. Are you that type of guy or do you just kind of play based on instinct? I've always played based on instinct, but... I mean, let's face it, if you're going to be alive in today's poker world, you have to get into the solvers. You have to get into the analytic side of things. So I've, you know, gotten to the solvers. I've gotten uh, in groups that we run solvers and we, we do things and we're, we're constantly working on our game. And when you're working on your game and you're doing it all in the GTO solver area. So um, if you're going, like I said, if you're going to be a good poker player, in today's day and age, you have to know how to play a, a good understanding of what GTO is and how to deviate from it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and I, the funny thing is, is I used to tell people that um, I like to, and this is what you commonly hear is, I like to mix up my game. I like to just play off the cuff. Well, at the end of the day, you don't really know what you're doing. You're just making decisions and, and the, for whatever reason, and you, you're not deviating from a solid strategy. You're just throwing shit against the wall and hoping it sticks. Right. Um, it was what I did for 15 years at least. Um, so it's really when you get in and understand the baseline of what you're supposed to be doing, mm -hmm. and then you can actually strategically deviate from that based on different opponents. Definitely. Definitely fabulous advice there. And tell me, what is your, obviously as poker players, we're all kind of degenerates in our own ways. What is your biggest like gambling escapade through the years? Sports. <laughs> <laughs> Sports. That's it. Yep. Good Sports. Comp, yeah. um, I, I don't have any issues with the other table game slots. Um, never had, th those were never my issues. Mm -hmm. um, but sports. Yeah. I like, I like throwing down on some sports and, Mm -hmm. um I, that's generally the thing that i you know if i have a leak that's it awesome. well now it's turned into nfts too but yeah um, that's a big business on nfts and they've taken off yep. crazy and a couple more questions before we let you go so say if you made the world series of poker final table again 
what other players would you want to be at that table with you? Uh, honestly, I would want nine players that have never played before and that are obviously there by pure happenstance. And um, I don't want anybody that I can name by name. Um, I mean, the, the worst, you know, for, from a publicity side, I mean, obviously, you know, it'd be nice to have like Daniel Negreanu, Phil Holm, if yep. all, all these players there just because it would be good for the game. Mm -hmm. But from my bottom line, yeah, just give me a bunch of no-namers that don't even know how to count and somehow just luck their way into getting there like I did. So love that, it. that's my choice. Awesome. I love it. You're just like a man's man. Want to play with the general Joes out there, not the famous players. And really last question, if you can go heads up against any professional poker player, who would you go up against? Um, you know, honestly, I've, I've played against everybody. Um, I, if I had to pick one, it would probably be um, Stu Unger because I never got the opportunity. Legend. Um, he passed away before I got the um, the chance to do it. But mm -hmm. I, mean, I played with Doyle Brunson and, mm -hmm. you know, Phil Hama, Daniel Grant. I played heads up with all these guys. And, um, you know, it, it, it it's fine. But at the end of the day, they're just other people. And um, it, would be, it would be cool to play with someone like um, Stu Unger, you know, to see what he – was doing back then is i mean what he was doing back then is probably similar to what we're doing now mm -hmm. he was just so far ahead of his time when everybody else was playing you know checkers he was playing chess whatever yeah. so yeah it, it would be it would be interesting to see how he did in today's game awesome well chris thank you so much for coming on thanks for all the work you do for the poker community and the world thanks for changing the whole dynamic of no limit texas hold'em and getting poker players to play poker, gamble responsibly. And Chris, we'll keep in touch. Thanks for coming on. Thanks for having me on. Good talking to you guys and uh, talk to you soon. Take care.